We got to start with the Mets because what is wrong with these hitters? And you can boo Francisco Lindor till the cows come home. It's not just Lindor. And I know it's early, 19 games in. I get it. It's been a weird start to the season. But how long are we going to blame that? Did they forget how to hit? I mean, they get swept in the two-game set with the Red Sox, who are obviously playing very well. But they look bad at the plate. It barely feels competitive when they're in the box. And here's Luis Rojas from last night sort of underscoring it all. The approach was just off. I mean, late on fastballs, uh, chasing breaking balls, taking pitches in the zone. Uh, it, it was just it was just off. We were off. Uh, and uh, it was consistent. You know, like a lot of hitters, you know, were kind of like in between. Yes, 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 yes. Off. Very, very off. It looked off. And you know what? Like, the numbers, they're just bad. They're just bad when you look at the Mets and their and their lineup. I mean, you're talking about average with uh, runners in scoring position. They are dead last. Runners in scoring position, two outs. They are dead last in Major League Baseball. Runners on. Just runners on. They're average 22nd in, in Major League Baseball. They're 23rd in the league in high leverage situations. They're scoring an average of three runs a game. You know what that's good for? Dead last. They're 23rd in hits per game. They're dead last in home yeah. runs per game. You want to know where they are top 10 when it comes to hitting? They're eighth in strikeouts per game. So there you go. It has just been bad and you know maybe the day off helps but considering how many days off I don't know how the another disruption in this schedule is all of a sudden going to get them back on track but if it is the approach at the plate then you need to be taking extra extra BP or extra something extra film extra heat maps extra whatever you're looking at Moose because it's not just Lindor it's not just Lindor it's the whole lineup who appears to be in this big funk yeah, the game last night stunk. Oh. I mean, and 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 it's not, not, not just the not just the Mets offense. I mean, to have a baseball game, think about. It. I mean, to have a baseball game in which you have two teams that have fifty eight at bats between the two of them that engage and have five walks, six hits, and strike out thirty times. It's embarrassing. I mean, it is just an absolute embarrassment when you look at it. I mean, that is that's a joke. I mean, that really is when the swing and miss nature that you get in today's days. It's more of a you know kind of a a conversation about where baseball is going right now. And you want to talk about having more action on the base pass, and we can get into the extra inning rule, and you can talk about situational hitting, and we can talk about approach up at the plate. I mean, all of these things. I mean. The, the the Mets last night and the Red Sox. I mean, listen, DeGrom had nine strikeouts. He didn't have 18 strikeouts. He had nine. I mean, you look at May struck out the side when he stepped in. Loop, who hadn't even seen in the six days, he registered a strikeout. And Edward Diaz had two to go along with Pavetta and Whitlock and Adovino and Barnes, who struck out the side in the ninth inning. I mean, 30 strikeouts between two teams in a Major League Baseball game in 2021. We're talking about advanced scouting, analytics. It's an utter embarrassment. I mean, that's really Really what it comes down to, to have six measly hits between two teams. I understand DeGrom, but DeGrom even admitted after the game that he did not felt feel right, and he was working his way through things and gave up some hits in that second inning, but still, the very fact is, is that he wasn't your typical DeGrom style, you know, he wasn't your typical DeGrom brilliant last night. He had the nine Ks, he was very, very good. But he wasn't what he was Friday night, where he registered the 15 strikeouts. I mean, that was that was one of those games where you look at, it basically makes your eyes bleed watching that baseball game. The approach up at the plate, the swings and misses. I mean, Nimmo, at one point in time, struck out on a pitch where he had no idea what the hell was coming up to the plate uh, by Adovino. And it was an embarrassing swing on a cold strike three to the point where, if you look back, it was comically bad, his swing and miss on the on the strike three. So... I look at that game on the whole, yes. Uh, you know, overall, you look at that game last night, one nothing game, you could say, okay, pitchers duel, great. The lack of the lack of action over the course of that game and the thirty strikeouts between two teams and just six measly hits and fifty eight at bats to go along with just the five walks is an utter disgrace. Now you get to the Mets, what are you gonna do? There's there's really nothing that the Mets can do. You can Maggie, you ran through all the stats. You can joke around about exactly you know what's Chili Davis doing, what this Met team is doing, the messaging from Luis Rojas, whether you know last year's in this team's head. But I mean, there's really nothing to do. 
you have to think these guys have got to find a way to start to hit the baseball. I mean, that's it. I mean, situational hitting, getting on base. I mean, last year was about the situational hitting. They were really good in every other offensive category in the National League, Major League Baseball, getting on guys on base, putting guys in scoring position. Last year, they were living, leaving small villages on the base pass every single night. So that was the concern. Now you're not even getting the traffic on the base pass, and you're getting this swing and miss nature up and down the lineup and the lack of competitive at-bats as well. But what do you do? You're locked in. You're not doing anything with McCann. I mean, we've had the conversation about J.D. Davis, not about his offense, more so a case about his defense. You can look at Francisco Lindor, McNeil, Alonzo, Conforto, Nimmo, Dom Smith. Where are you going? I mean, there, there's nothing that the Mets can all of a sudden do to cry. And kind of, you want to shake the lineup up? Is that all of a sudden going to get the approach better with this team? No, it's not. They have to find a way. It's only been 19 games. It's been a stop and start nature to it. We can't go back to free agency and coulda, woulda, shoulda what they did, what they should have done. You know, that was more about the defense than anything else, even though Springer was a great all around player as a center fielder. I can't go there. I, you know, they've got to figure it out. If it's Chili Davis uh, going back to work, this team trying to figure out what their approach needs to be, if it's the stress of the DeGrom start, but it's not even just that. It's when other guys are on the mound as well. Yeah, it's this team DeGrom. is just not scoring runs. It's beyond DeGrom just because it's so glaring when it's a DeGrom start because, A, let's be honest, more eyes are on DeGrom starts because he's so good and because it's become such a big storyline because rightfully so. I mean, again, it's a, a game where, you know, he gives up one run, doesn't get the win. Obviously, the team loses, so he's not going to get the win. But, you know, you look at since 2018 with DeGrom, just his starts, the Mets record, just when he's on the mound, is 39-42. and 42. Like, that's not commensurate with what he's giving you and also with the best pitcher in baseball. So, yeah, listen, this is what makes me nervous about it. it not because you're not going to do anything. And you know what? This lineup going into the season, you're like, this is going to be a strength. Like, we were more concerned and worried about the bullpen. Hell, they've been great. Like, we were worried about the bullpen and how that was going to impact the Mets' season. Meanwhile, it's been the hitters. We talked about this with the Yankees. Now we're talking about it with the Mets. But the problem about and what, what like, I hate hearing is when Luis Rojas is on with, with Carton and Evan last night, yesterday afternoon, rather, and says, you know, they're, they're having this anxiety with runners in scoring position. Like, here's the thing. We, I, t- I joked yesterday, Louie, lie to me, lie to me. Don't tell me that you know, you're being haunted from 2020 and it's, it's bleeding over to 2021. Lie to me. But I was joking. You know, to say that they're having anxiety, I, I'm not like going to pound Luis Rojas for being honest about that. If, that's, if they're going to be open and honest, that's what the team's feeling. But why? Like, why? And are they going to be able to get well, to the bottom success, of it? That's why. But they so it's it's only because of the past. But Rojas, when Evan asked him, like, well, why aren't you guys like? Don't you want to be confident and relaxed when you're in these kind of like? What makes you think you're going to turn it around? He's like, well, we have a track record of guys being good hitters. So like, what what can weigh out here? Is it going to be the track record of you know the guys can hit, or is it going to be the more recent track record of you haven't been getting hits with runners in scoring position, and that's going to tilt this towards like the negative and towards the anxiety, like. If you have to channel whatever Pete Alonso was doing his rookie year, like, I don't know if that's the case. I can't get into a baseball player's head. But the idea that there's this anxiety, like, I, if it's mechanical, if it's something baseball, if it's something like X's and O's, I think it's so much easier to fix because as good at-bats are contagious for a baseball team, bad at-bats are contagious for a baseball team. And if collectively they're feeling some kind of anxiety, then – they're doomed. Like honestly, no, they are. Not. I mean, they're they're not. I mean, I don't think they're. I mean, maybe I'm we've saying given that Rojas, they may not go to the playoffs. Like that well, could. I, I, well, could I mean, get anything's that level. I mean, we're only 19 games into the season. I mean, I, I don't want to. You want to say that they're? You brought up the Yankee comparisons. There's more of a history with the Yankees, obviously, offensively. Where, as I mentioned to Jack Curry earlier in the week, the trust factor that you have in that Yankee lineup that they're going to turn around. You don't have that trust factor up and down the lineup with this Met team because you've lived it. They haven't been the epitome of success and they haven't been one of those teams where you say, okay, well, it's only 19 games. Yes, their offensive stats are horrific, but there's five, six, four or five years of of consistent success to say they're going to eventually turn around. Individually, you can no, look at guys. You can individually years, look at guys that like Alonzo. You can look at Michael Conforto. There are things like that. But I think when you look at Luis Rojas, 
I'm going to give him credit because we've talked about how he is a great communicator with the players. We talk about the connection that he has with the players. I mean, just maybe that's what this group needs to hear. I mean, if if it's if it's a case where, okay, lie to me and we were joking around about it yesterday where you don't say, well, the ghost of last year or being haunted from a year ago or the statement that he made to Cardinal Roberts yesterday, I understand that there's a lot of people that are very critical of Rojas and the explanations after the game needs to be a little bit more fiery, feisty, whatever it might be. But maybe Rojas judging this room, being around this team, feels like, you know, this group needs to hear it. Uh, you know, they need to hear it, that they are pressing, that they are stressing, that uh, they are haunted. Maybe all of those things where, you know, that's where Rojas, I'll give him, I think he's a very smart baseball man. I don't think he's making a mistake by putting that messaging out there, whether it be on a Zoom call or whether it be on with Craig and Evan yesterday afternoon. I don't. Now it's a matter of trying to fix it because that's really going to be on on this group and each and every one of these individuals. So, It's not a case of everyone's wrong mechanically or you look at the approach of the play. Yes, confidence is a real deal in professional athletics. You've you've heard guys talk about all the time. Hell, you hear Boomer talking about it each and all the time on the morning show with uh, with Greg. You know, the the confidence in in this team right now, confidence-wise, in that lineup is just not there. Individually, you've seen guys get off to good starts. Like Brandon Nimmo was off to a rip-roaring start. Dom Smith was off to a very, very good start. Now it's kind of overtaken this team and... They're eventually going to start hitting. I mean, and the pitching is going to keep them in and keep them competitive into the, in these games. It's not like the Boston Red Sox went out there and beat the Mets like a drum the last two nights. They didn't. They won a game last night, won nothing. The Mets, if they just did a little bit offensively, they would have won the baseball game. So there are strengths that this team can lean on, especially with their starting rotation and the fact that the bullpen has pitched well to say, all right, well, we can we can afford ourselves a little bit more time here because we do have the arms that are going to keep us into these games. You and I are going to disagree on that with Luis Rojas. I don't think bringing up past failures is the way to te- get this team to stop feeling anxiety. Why I think- not? bringing up those failures think about all the times that you failed you want that in your head when you're going to the plate when you're trying to break out of something like that I'm not saying that he can sweep it under the rug and that's fine but I mean to be to be talking about their anxiety I mean then then you got to address it right you got to address it how can you find a way to be relaxed I'm not not talking about with the medium or with the fans I'm talking about with your team how that that's part of it you can be a great communicator and that's fantastic how are you going to communicate to them that they need to relax a little bit or that they need to find a way or that they need to let their you know fall back on the mechanics that got them there or their best seasons like that's going to be part of it he's going to have to help them navigate their way out of this if it is a confidence thing and if it is between the years that does really that to me does fall under the manager's purview the state of the clubhouse the sort of collective sort of feel of the clubhouse I think that does actually fall under his umbrella. And if they're feeling anxious right now, then it's incumbent on him and the rest of the coaching staff to ease everybody up or or know your guys well enough that you do know what to say. Do you think pointing out their past failures is what's going to help them? Personally, I think that would be a. I would not take that approach. That's me. I wouldn't. I wouldn't start well, harping on I the past but, failures. But he's reading the room. He knows his players better than anybody. That's the point. I mean, that, yeah, that, that really is. So if he's reading the failures. room and he knows his players better than anybody, if he wants to throw that message out there, then if it's not going to be the cozy, everything's great, or we've got to relax, or this or that, the same repetitive kind of 15-second baseball quote that you get from managers when a team is struggling offensively, he's being real, he's being genuine, he's probably throwing something out there that he feels like his team needs to hear, right? So, I mean... He's being open and honest. I mean, the team stinks offensively. I mean, that's it. I mean, if he came on and said, well, we just got to relax. Well, they had 15 strikeouts last night against the Boston way. They got shut down by Nick Pavetta. Yeah, it's not Um, like they were facing aces the last two days. I look at at Rojas on the whole, and, you know, the pressure's on him. This team is as after they sign Lindor, but it's also on guys. You know, you you look at Francisco Lindor, he's hitting 203. I mean, Lindor, and, and he could be telling people that he's not in a slump. Francisco Lindor's hitting 203. He could say, well, I'm, I'm laugh about the booze or that I didn't come here to win an MVP. I came here to win baseball games. Well, I mean, my message to Frankie would be this. You've had opportunities to impact games early on in this season, and you're hitting 091 with runners in scoring position. So if it's all about the wins, 
it, you haven't generated the big hits that you're expected to year one early on, 19 games into this season. Francisco Lindor, a guy that you just paid $341 million to, is hitting 203, and his on-base percentage is at 31%. 